Hi, today I want to talk about ignition systems. These can be useful both for starting rocket engines as well as for starting fireworks. And I'll start out with the warning. We're going to be dealing with some extremely flammable materials. And so if you're uncomfortable with the chemistry or with the techniques, find somebody that has experience with this or don't try this yourself. Now a few weeks ago, we went ahead and built some sugar-based solid rocket engines. I went through the formulation of the fuels as well as the construction of the engines, but we've only just gotten started. We're going to be going to much larger engines as well as hybrid engines. We're going to be going to more sophisticated fuels. This fuel grain is based on an ammonium perchlorate HTPB or rubber-based composite fuel. It's much more powerful than the sugar-based rocket engines. It's much hotter and it's what the pros use. Now when we tested our engines outside we just used Fuse in order to be able to get them started. And Fuse has the convenience of being super inexpensive and very easy to set up. The problem is with fuses is first of all safety. When you light a fuse, you're committed. And so even if you get a little troop of ducklings wandering across the field after you've lit it, they're toast. There's nothing you can do to stop it. Secondly, the way a rocket engine is started is not optimal if you use a fuse, because if you in insert the fuse through the nozzle end like this, what happens is the first combustible mixture that sees the advancing flame front is right down here near the nozzle and the best place to start the rocket engine is up at this end because when the flame initiates here the hot exhaust gases will travel down the central core and ignite the entire central core almost instantaneously providing you a very good start very reliable but when you initiate the flame here near the nozzle you create a bit of a vapor lock and so you're trying to get the fuel to be burned against the outflow or the exhaust of the engine so it's a little bit less stable, a little bit less reliable. And furthermore, if you're trying to start an engine that has a large internal volume, a large engine, the feeble heat of a fuse is not going to initiate the burn throughout the entire central cavity at the same time. You want a lot more energy. And if you get to hybrid engines, you need even more energy than that. So that's why we're going to get into using electric starters and augmentation of electric starters. Now, the design of an electric starter, most commercial starters, is based on what's called a bridge wire. If you see this thin gauge multi-stranded wire here, you'll notice that I cut about a quarter of an inch to maybe, oh, I don't know, centimeter, centimeter and a half of insulation off of this end, and I've bent most of the conductors away from the center. Right in the middle, I have two thin conductors that are laying next to each other. And if you put a little dab of solder on the far end of that and cut away the additional wires, you have created what's called a bridge wire. It's a resistive element, sort of like an electric fuse. And this resistor, when energized by power through the big thick conductor here, will get red hot very quickly. And if you surround this with some very sensitive pyrotechnic material, it will then burst into flame, which will then start your engine. And this is basically how commercial starters are built. If you take a look at this electric match, uh, it's called what MJG Firewire, and you can buy these in quantity, and they're based on the same sort of design, which is a bridge wire with a small amount of pyrotechnic mix at the end. There are other manufacturers that make different formats of the same sort of design, but it's the same idea. And in this particular case, they also come with a little cap that when it slides over the end like this, will direct the flame up toward the upper end of the engine, so it's, it's ideal. Now the thing is though, you can make these yourself. And the way that I've done this is rather than try to fabricate my own material, I got a little kit from a company called Quick Burst, and it's called Hot Shot. 
And what this kit consists of is a small container with some carbon black, a little bit of a binder, which I believe is an acrylic resin, and then a packet of oxidizer. You mix all these together in a container like this, and then you add acetone to it to create a slurry, sort of a thin slurry that you can place on the end of your bridge wire. Now, if you notice here, this stuff has become very rigid, very hard, because the acetone, even in a sealed container, will quickly evaporate. That's not a problem, though, because you can refurbish or essentially re-energize this as many times as you want by simply adding some fresh acetone. So if you take a little dropper and this dried out mixture here, and you add some acetone to it, like this, you can just stir this up. Now this takes a minute or two, especially if it's gotten very, very hard. And if you've not added enough, just add another dropper. If you've added too much, just leave it open for 10 minutes and it'll evaporate away. So now that this is blended up, you get to the point where the drop will tend to hang. Just like that. Then the way you use this material is you're going to take another thin conductor like this and you're going to strip a little bit of insulation from the end, about a quarter of an inch, half a centimeter or so. And the trick to doing this is you're going to do it at right angles so that each of the blades will cut the insulation off the outside of this thin wire. And we'll do that like this. And if I do it right, not bad. You'll see that you have the two parallel conductors right at this end like that. Then what you're going to do is you're going to insert this into the liquid like this. And you're going to move it around a little bit so that there's no bubbles in between. And when you pull it out, you can see you get a little bit of a conductive material on there of the pyrotechnic material. Now, if you wait about 10 seconds, you can put it back in and get a little bit more in order to get a thicker, larger spark. Now, this stuff dries so quickly that within about 10 or 15 seconds, you can actually touch this. But something that you'll notice is I didn't create a bridge wire. And the reason for that is because the carbon black in this material is conductive. And so if we hook one that I've had sitting here for maybe about half an hour or so, and we hook this up to the volt ohm meter like this, and we'll turn this on. So this has about 9 ohms of resistance. You want about 6 to 12 ohms of resistance so that if you put a 12 volt potential across here, you're going to end up getting between 12 and 24 watts in that tiny little area. So within a few milliseconds of connecting this up, this will get red hot and it will burst and you don't have to make the bridge wire so it saves time. Now this kit is not cheap. It's about $40 for one of these kits, but because you can make hundreds of these and very quickly customize the amount of energy, it's kind of a nice trick to have in addition to the commercially made units. Now the final issue is how do we get the flame big? And we could theoretically keep dipping it into this quick burst, but that's expensive and it's going to take a lot of time. And that's why what I have over here is a setup to create an amplifier for our starters. Now the first thing you'll probably notice here is that I have an anti-static mat down here. This is hooked up to the building's ground system. And in the dry New England winters, it gets very dry here. And there's the potential to develop static charges, which can create sparks, which can ignite this very flammable fuel. And so just like building a computer or electronics or lasers, these are nice to have around when you're working with those. In addition, these come with little straps that you can put on your wrist in order to ground you so that you also won't develop a static charge. 
Furthermore, when mixing this type of material, you do not want to use plastic containers because when you create friction on plastic, you have a chance of developing static electricity. So a better material to use with these is glass and wood. Finally, make up the least amount you need for your project. You don't want to make up a huge tub of this and store it because, as you'll see, this stuff is extremely flammable. Now, the materials used are very simple. Ammonium perchlorate, aluminum powder, and barium sulfate. Now, these two materials come in different mesh sizes or granular sizes. Typically, when you're building a composite rocket engine, you'll use a 400 micron particle size. It tends to control the burn velocity, and it also allows you to pack a little bit more of the oxidizer into the, the matrix binder. For pyrotechnic mixtures, 200 microns tends to be a little bit more common. It's a little easier to blend, and it's widely available. You don't want to grind this up any finer because this will create a much more rapid burn. You don't want that. So the 200 micron is where you want to stick. Aluminum, similarly, size matters. You want to be in the 1 to 5 micron range. When the particles get too big, the surface area goes down and it doesn't burn very well. And if you get into the nanoscale powders below a micron, they become so unstable they can actually ignite in air. So the optimal range is a few microns, and five microns is what I found to be the best. It's widely available, it's inexpensive, it blends well with the perchlorate. And the formula is extremely simple. Equal amounts by weight of the perchlorate and the aluminum powder. That's it. The barium sulfate is an, addition, an interesting addition. It acts as a catalyst to speed the reaction, and it also changes what is sort of a white-hot shower of sparks into a superheated gas. I find that it starts the engines a little bit more reliably. In addition, it produces a beautiful green uh, flame or superheated gas, and so it's very pretty. So I'll show you how to use this. Now what we're going to do is we're going to start out by mixing up a total of 10 grams of this material. So we're going to use 5 grams of this and 5 grams of this. So you're not going to be able to see the readings on the scale, but trust me, 5 grams is 5 grams. So just mix that up right like this. And it's not very demanding. You could be off by about 10% and the performance is very similar. Off by 2%. That was quick. And then the aluminum powder. And once you start adding the second component, remember you can't take it out, so you want to go a little slow. So we're going to go to a total of 10. Good. Perfect. Now, the best way to mix this is slowly by hand. We don't want to use a coffee grinder or a ball mill or a blender because you don't want to develop high pressures, high temperatures, or any kind of static electricity. So taking a wooden stick, you just simply flip it like this. Just rotate and stir. So it only takes a couple minutes, and I mean like two minutes, and you'll get a nice blend where you can't see any of the white particles and any dark areas that are different in uh, hue. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take 5 grams and put it back out, back into this beaker here. So what we're going to do is basically split the 10 into two equal amounts. That's it. Now the barium sulfate. This is added to the flash powder 4 parts to 5 parts. So if we mixed up 5 grams here, we're going to add 4 grams of the barium sulfate. And then similarly, we're going to mix this up the same way. Turn it on its side and just stir it. Now that they're mixed, what we've got to do is we've got to get these to surround the starter because this is basically an amplifier. So what we need to do is we need to get a starter to hold the material in a way that we can still insert it into the engine. Now I've tried mixing this into pastes and wrapping it into little tubes, but I found the easiest way to do that is simply a soda straw, these standard flex straws, even though we're not going to use the flex part of them, or these Mongo straws that are made for malteds and milkshakes or if you're in a real hurry. 
Anyway, by cutting these down to a segment that is two inches or five centimeters long in each case, it creates a really nice starter. You could certainly customize the length, but this works well. Now, in order to get this to work, if we're gonna use the commercial starter, if we try to place this starter into the small straw, it won't fit, it won't connect. And so if we take the little cap here and pull it all the way off, what we're gonna do is we're going to fix this in the end of the straw like this, and I'll show you how in just a sec. And in the case of the bigger straw, like this one, you'll see that we have a problem because it's so loose, it won't fix in there. So what I do is I take advantage of a bushing here made out of silicone rubber tubing. This is a 3 8 OD, 3 30 seconds wall thickness, which is about nine millimeters and about two, two and a half millimeters on the metric scale. And I cut it into small segments. So I've cut this into little 3 8 or centimeter long segments that act as bushings. Now, if what you do is you take these and you place them on the end of the cap like this, but not all the way so that you have a little bit of a taper at the end. You can then insert this into the tubing like this, except it's kind of tight. It's hard to get this to insert all the way in. And so you can use a little bit of a trick, and that is isopropyl alcohol is an excellent, very short acting lubricant for silicone tubing. You can use it in the lab, you can use it to put tight silicone tubing on um, glassware and metal tubes. So what you do is you just dip the end of this into a small amount of isopropyl alcohol and now it just slips right in there like that. And within about 30 seconds it's going to be dry. And what you want is you want this to be inserted a little bit deep so that you have a little bit of a ridge here. Now I'm going to go over to the other table and I'm going to show you how we get these things fixed so that they're nice and secure. Okay, so now what I have is a little vise here that I'm going to use just to hold this in a vertical position. And then we're going to take a little hot glue and we're just going to put a small dab of the glue on top here, not because we're trying to create any kind of watertight or airtight seal, but this little flange effect will tend to keep this plug in under a little bit of back pressure when the burst occurs. That's, that's the only purpose of this. Then, with respect to the small ones, what we're going to do is we're going to put a small amount of the glue directly into the end of the straw, like this. Just form a little glob. And then, while this is still liquid, we take the starter and we're actually going to push it right through here, right into here like this. And we're just going to hold it there for maybe 15 seconds. And while this cools and solidifies, this will then stabilize and we have a starter. Now we have to fill this with the flash powder. Now we'll start out with the big one, like this. And we're going to fill this with the standard flash powder over here. You can see it's a little darker than its partner and there's less of it because we haven't added as much powder. And the trick to adding this is like really easy. You simply use the stick to feed it in the end of the tube. After you put a couple of doses in there, then turn it vertically like this and give it a couple of taps just to make sure that the powder is in contact with the with the starter and you don't have any big gaps in there. And then just continue on. Now when you get this to about a centimeter or so from the end, you need to seal this. Now you could use hot glue. I've actually tested the hot glue gun and even the tip with the flash powder. It doesn't ignite it. But it is getting pretty hot, so I don't know that I would advise you to do that. You could also put some silicone resin in there, or some putty, or even epoxy. The problem with some epoxies is some formulations will react with the ammonium perchlorate and produce a lot of ammonia gas, so you don't want to do that. And I found that the West systems, for example, do produce a lot of a gas. And secondly, you probably don't want a solid barrier here because when you do that and you don't give any way for the gases to get out, it turns this more into a firecracker 
rather than a whoosh of hot gases or hot sparks. And so the best thing to use, I've found, is simple cotton. You simply take a piece of cotton like this, and when you do about three or four of these, you'll be able to estimate the size pretty well on a first take. But you just roll this up into a little ball, and you're going to push it into the end of the tube here, like this. Now, if you take off too much, you can just pull this out and pull a little bit off. If you do too little, don't add a few extra pieces. They tend to fall out. Just throw it away and get another piece of, of wadding. But you just push that in there like that, and you're done. Now, the little one is done the same way as the big one, except it's a little bit more problematic to fill because of the small diameter. But it is basically the same technique. You simply take the little scooper and you feed it in here. And then again, when you get this to about a centimeter from the end, just take another wad of cotton, roll it up into a little ball like this, insert it into the end like that, and then press to fit, like that, and you're set. You got two of them done. Now you could obviously do a dozen of these at a time. Now the question is, how do you get this ignited? How do you get this started? Now you can get starters online or at hobby shops, which are basically just batteries and switches. You can even get electronic systems that place a receiver and a battery next to the rocket and then a transmitter that you use remotely. Now, I don't have anything to say negative about that type of a design, except I like the personal sort of visual of seeing wires connected or not connected. And so I'm going to stay away from the electronics, at least for now. Plus, they can be very expensive. So in looking into this, I decided rather than just to buy something online, I would go ahead and build it. And let me show you the design I have for the starter that we're going to be using tonight. Okay, you can see the layout of the starter we built it is pretty straightforward. We took one of our smaller 12 volt drone batteries and simply attached to this to the top of this base with a piece of very strong Velcro. This holds it in position, but it lets you take it off and recharge it. This has a lot of amp power capacity. You could probably launch a thousand rockets with this particular battery. Now this attaches here, and then it's connected up to a keyed switch. We got this for like $9 on Amazon, very inexpensive. And then we have an indicator tower over here, which I also picked up on Amazon for about $14. We'll put a link in the description below to these two particular items. And the way this works is pretty straightforward. We connect the battery up to the switch, and you'll see that the green indicator light says that we have power in the system. Then when we hit the keyed connector over here, you get both a visual and an auditory indicator that this switch is now live. If we then hook this up to a 12 volt load like this and fire in the hole, you can see that it works. But if we hit the key, you see that it doesn't. So it's kind of a nice feature and the auditory is really nice to have when you're not looking at things and you're wiring them up. It gives you a little bit of an extra safety feature. Now the other component here, I'll turn this around just so that you can see this, are these push to connect speaker um, posts. Simply by pushing this down you line up two holes that allow you to insert a wire and when you let go it securely supports this. And these, this probably cost a dollar. You can get these things at any kind of a online shop. And then finally, underneath here, you'll see, I'm going to disconnect the battery power, you see that we have mounted this on a couple of four anti-slip posts. These little pads keep it stable on a table so that it doesn't slide off or rock. And the way that I did the wiring for the inside of this is pretty simple. I took advantage of this P rigid PVC foam board that we use for so many of our projects because it's waterproof, it's insulating electrically and thermally, it's easy to glue and screw, it's inexpensive, it's lightweight, and it, it just works very nicely, and it looks nice. And then what I did 
is I simply hand routed a little notch into each of the two panels just to make some room for the hidden wiring between the two switches. And then the wiring diagram itself is actually on the indicator light. So this is like a no brainer to construct. And when you put this together again, you have a nice stable mount that you can move in and out and works very well as you'll see in just a couple minutes. Now something else that you'll note here on these connector wires is I've done something that I do a lot in the laboratory and in the shop, which is I cut the two conductors at a different length. And then on each one of my starters, I did the same sort of thing. And what this does is it's another layer of safety. It just tends to make it more difficult for you to accidentally short connectors. And it's a nice trick. You can always use insulating caps or cups or receptacles, but it's just another layer of safety and it's a nice thing to do whenever you're gonna be using exposed wiring. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this system outside and we're going to test both our homemade starters uh, the commercial starters, the augmented starters, and we're also going to try to start some of our new composite rocket fuel. So let's get going. Alright, so let's hook up the electricity here. Okay, so we have power. This is the commercial electric match. This is our homemade electric match. Fire in the hole. All right, this is the flash powder. Fire in the hole. Pretty good. Now this is the barium sulfate version of the flash powder. Fire in the hole. Notice how green it was. Okay, this is gonna be one of the bigger starters with the standard flash powder. Fire in the hole. Pretty impressive, huh? Okay, this is one of the larger starters with the standard flash powder. Fire in the hole. Okay, this is one of the larger starters with the barium sulfate augmented flash powder. Fire in the hole. Wow. <laughs> okay, so let's see if we can start some of this uh, new composite rocket fuel with one of the starters. Fire in the hole. Admit it. <laughs> it's pretty good. Uh, do you have another one, or is that? The I can do another one. Yeah, can you do one more? Yeah. I think I'll set up the camera. Uh. <laughs> Boy, that thing would have reached the uh, stratosphere, huh? <laughs> Fire in the hole. Well, that was a lot of fun. Let's try it again. Fire in the hole.
<laughs> We're now nearly in orbit. Well, while that's burning, I guess I'll finish up. So what we're going to do is we're going to use these starters uh, to advance to more powerful engines, obviously put some nozzles in these rockets so that we can get some real thrust. We'll do some thrust measurements with our test sled and uh, we'll be advancing both in size and uh, in fuels. So if you like what we're doing on this channel, please subscribe. And uh, if you want to take a look at some of the other rocket videos that we've done, you might find them interesting too. Please leave a comment if you liked what you saw or if you have any questions because I read them all and I try to answer any questions that you bring up and it gives us ideas for other videos and other subjects that we might be able to cover. So thanks a lot for watching, stay safe, and we'll see you soon.